Okay, can you hear me okay? I can. All right. Well, uh, okay, so what I'll do is I'll just go in and um, uh, give a little introduction, and then I'll just right. kind of hand it over to you. And I'm going to start with the Affordable Care Act stuff, and then we can go into the HIPAA stuff after that. Okay. So. Okay, yeah, I've, I've done – I've hosted podcasts myself, so. Okay. Uh, what what, okay. Uh, what kind of uh, – you just have a, a little tap to the recorder or – yeah, it's a really cool um, app, the, and it, it, I mean, man, it is just done beautifully so far. So oh, I'm, it's an app. Okay. It's an app, and it's actually merging a call with a line that just records everything, and then it just sends me an MP3. Oh, that's really easy. Yeah, it's really great. Yeah. It's ten bucks, you know. Yeah. So, so yeah, I'm pretty I'm pretty excited about that. I did the the analog thing uh, when Radio Shack was still around, you know, with one oh, of those yeah. things you plug into the to the phone line and then the other end. And well, see, that was my phone. problem. Yeah. That's the only reason why I haven't done one of these before. And you know, now that I've got it to where I can just make it so easy to do, man. Yeah. And you know, it's been doing really well, so I'm kind of excited. Great. So yeah, it was uh, you started last week. Yeah, I just started last week, but I've done one every day. I've got another one to put up there tonight, and then I'll probably do yours pretty quick because I want to kind of highlight that it's going to be about different stuff. So yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's been super cool so far. That's great. No, I, uh, I you know I admire your your tenacity. I just <laughs> don't well, know. I can do one every day. <laughs> Well, Unless you know, that was it is. Yeah. they've been so easy to edit. And then, yeah. you know, the ones that are, where I do it about music and stuff, it's just, you know, it's people I've known or, you know, known of. And so, I mean, I got one with Dan Baird from the Georgia Satellites, who's just a great interview. And oh, it'll no be kidding. coming up later this week. And, yeah. you know, so we've got, you know. Don't, got, don't tell me you got the last interview with Bowie. <laughs> I will. <laughs> I would have loved that. I mean, that was yeah. a sad deal all the way around. Yeah. But, but yeah, I feel like I've got some good stuff, and I feel like it's going to um, – I feel like that what I'm doing is just going to kind of, you know, open up some more people. So that's kind of the thing. You know, I think there will be some more, um, you know, things opening up. So I, that's probably the thing that I'm most excited about. Oh, it absolutely will. So – yeah, well, and so where did you do your podcast? What was that for? I did it for myself. I, you know, I, I had a blog. I still have it. It's kind of dormant, although I actually posted something today. Oh, uh, because I'm I'm really not allowed to compete with with my oh. employer. <laughs> but I, you would have met it in that. Uh-huh. Well, so that's cool. So. um well, anyway, I'll get in and let you, you know, kind of talk a little bit about what you've been doing. And, sure. And what, and, well, so a, real, real quick, what is Med City News? What What are they doing? What's their goal? Med City News covers the business of innovation in medicine. Okay. All right. And so does that mean that your topics that you're covering are maybe a little less broad than they once were or what? Uh, well, I, I have my own beats. I mean, we have we have someone else who's a uh, you know who does pharma. Uh-huh. Uh, I don't do any of the life sciences. We have somebody else who does startups. I'm more sort of the interface with the payers and providers, the oh. companies that yeah. Well, that's cool. Yeah. So okay, yeah. well let me let me introduce you then, and then we'll take it from there. So sure. Well, tonight I'm I'm really glad to have a, a old college friend of mine, Neil Vercel, who is um, now a reporter and 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 kind of a trend maker in the um, medical field. Neil, tell me a little bit about um, what you've been doing. Sure. Hi, Dale. It's nice to nice to be on with you. Yeah. I yeah, am. Yeah, I am a. Journalist uh, have been since I, since I graduated all those years ago. Um, well, one of the few people you know making a living, not not uh, living luxuriously, but I'm certainly making a living. I, I'm currently with a 
publication called Med City News, which is an online publication uh, dedicated to covering the business of innovation in in healthcare and medicine. My specialty is health information technology and uh, healthcare reform, including how to improve the quality of patient care and improving patient safety. And that's and, uh, you know, a beat that I've been on in very various forums for a good 15 years now. And so in the past, you used to do some writing with U.S. News and World Report. And tell me about some of the other places you've been. Sure. Well, you know, prior to, to joining Med City News last April, I was actually freelancing for 11 years. So you know, I worked with dozens of publications. Many of them are you know, sort of insider industry publications, but I did contribute for a couple of years to U.S. News and World Reports. Hospital of Tomorrow online channel, um, uh -huh. which you know is clearly the biggest name that that your listeners would be aware of. I also you know, contributed to um, had a blog on Forbes dot com for for a short while, which isn't as glamorous as it sounds, but it's you know good exposure. <laughs> and uh, you know some people who are sort of involved who might be involved in the general technology world might be familiar with Information Week. That's another one I contributed to on a, uh, uh, occasionally. Okay. Um, had a couple, couple of pieces published in the Chicago Sun Times, among others, but mostly mostly trade publications. So you know, people in the business, and only people in the business would be reading it. <laughs> uh, well, that's that's cool, and and the Med City News thing. Um, so what? Tell me a little bit more about that. How did you hook on with them? Sure. Um, they were a freelance client of mine. They, you know, had a limited freelance budget. And then at uh, the beginning of last year, they actually got bought by a larger company called Breaking Media uh, based in New York City. And uh, you may know in, in the legal business, one of their publications called Above the Law. Uh, okay. It's kind yeah. of uh, – it's it's kind of a not really a scandal sheet, but it's it's kind of an offbeat take on uh, on the legal business. They, they also have one uh, in uh, well, well, they have several industry industry verticals. I kind of hate to use that word, but I just did. <laughs> the, the including uh, well, they have one called Breaking Government, Breaking Defense. Um, they have one called Fashionista that actually covers the 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 fashion the business of the fashion industry. Uh -huh. So, um, and they have one called Deal Breaker that uh, you know follows a lot of um, mergers and acquisitions and okay. venture capital. Right. So well, yeah. Cool. Well, cool. Well, so um, Neil, I asked you to come on and you know just kind of talk about health and and the business of health and and the things that are, you know, impacting people. And when we started talking about it, we kind of, you know, talked about maybe some things that aren't as widely covered, um, you know. <clears throat> and and one of the things that you mentioned to me that I thought was a really interesting statement is that despite the fact that it seems like all we've been doing is have a debate about health care, you still think that, uh, there's really a need for a debate about health care. And yes. so tell me a little bit about that. Okay. Well, I, I don't think that – I think that the public has been fed so many sound bites, and, of course, our politics have become so, uh, you know, so uh, divisive in the last few years that I don't think we've had really an honest debate on – Real reform of of the healthcare system in the United States. I mean, everybody's familiar thinks they they're from everybody's heard of the Affordable Care Act, aka Obamacare. Although, you know, some people do still have the notion that they're different things. That you know, one has a a positive connotation, the other has a negative connotation, depending on what side of the political spectrum you fall on. Right. Um, they are the same thing. Obamacare is just the nickname for the the Affordable Care Act. Uh, but the debate that, that's been played out in the public has really only focused on not on health care but on insurance coverage. Okay. And they are they are two different things. I mean, you can have 
health insurance, but that's no guarantee that you're going to get good care. It just means right. that somebody's going to somebody else is going to pay for it. Okay. And uh, frankly, we have a we have a, a crisis in terms of uh, quality of care in the in the U.S. There's a study out there that I could I could send you the link to um, that from about two or three years ago that placed medical error as the third leading cause of death in this country. Wow. 400,000 400, people a year approximately uh, killed unnecessarily in uh, by, by poor health care. Wow. That seems like a lot more important than terrorism, doesn't it? Uh, it does, yes. It really <laughs> does. And you don't think of it in the big picture, but I, I guarantee you – Everybody has a story of someone that they know close to them, themselves personally, or someone that they know who was mistreated or misdiagnosed. Right. I guarantee you everybody has a story. I have one that's very personal. Uh, myself, was my, my dad was, uh, was badly mistreated while he was dying of a terminal disease, but uh, – I, it, well, it's tell more me, common tell than me people. about that disease, Neil, because yeah. that that has been something that's definitely informed what you're doing. So tell me about that. Absolutely, yeah. He had a, a rare neurological neurodegenerative disease called multiple system atrophy, which in many ways presents itself like Parkinson's disease, and it's considered on the Parkinson's spectrum. Uh, it essentially shuts down. Muscle groups one at a time, you know, one at a time until you can no longer move, until you can no, and then eventually you lose the ability to breathe, and that's, you know, and then you die. Uh, it's very, in many ways, very. It's it's the worst thing that I've ever seen. Uh, but from what I understand, it's not all that different from ALS. But everybody knows what ALS is because you know Lou Gehrig is associated with it, and of course Stephen Hawking. Uh, you know, I right, have, and but I mean, but, but, but tell but, me but, about the mis- but yeah, my dad's final month alive, he was admitted to a, a hospital near his home um, with a urinary tract infection, which uh, apparently is common in the end stage of this disease. Well, this hospital had uh, had no idea what multiple system atrophy was, and uh, you know they kept testing him for various things. Uh, that, that had nothing to do with with his disease, and then finally, three weeks after he was admitted, the infectious disease specialist who was overseeing his care admitted to, to my mother that he had never heard of he had never heard of this disease. I mean, that's just an ego thing right there. And as far as I'm concerned, it's it's unacceptable. And that, at that point, you should say uh, you should call in a neurologist and say we need somebody who who knows this disease and you know a lot of neurologists even if they've heard of it may never have seen a case in their careers so he and, was finally and transferred I'm, and i would oh, go, go ahead yeah and, and i think the reason why it was more than just ego also the longer that they could keep him in the hospital the more money the hospital could bring in which you know speaks to the perverse incentives in healthcare, that you know, basically more care means more money, and the incentive is to do more, even if it's not the right thing. And that's one of uh, one of the many reasons why our healthcare is so expensive in this country, right? Compared to compared to the rest of the world. And you know, getting back to to what I had started talking about about the Affordable Care Act, there are actually provisions in there that deal with the incentives to try to shift the incentives toward away from what's called fee for service you deliver a service and you get bill you, you bill for it and you get paid for that uh whether it's the right thing to do or not uh, a lot of duplicate a lot of duplicate testing a lot of unnecessary testing i know my dad was uh you know misdiagnosed while he was in the hospital somebody thought he might have had a stroke so they brought him in for a you know a ct scan and a and an MRI, which are both unnecessary, but you know, also cost somebody thousands of dollars. Right. Uh, right. Ultimately. Well, uh, and, you know, um, and you were using the example when you and I were talking that um, let, let's talk about somebody that has um, a disease like uh, congestive heart failure. Right. Um, tell me how things are different under 
the Affordable Care Act. Well, sure. Yeah, one thing that is actually in the law that probably, if we put the politics aside, uh, a lot of people would agree that it's a good thing to 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 uh, make this change. And this has been in place since actually, actually since 2011, even though the uh, insurance mandate in the Affordable Care Act didn't kick in until 2014. But uh, since 2011, Medicare, which is the largest individual uh, insurer in the country, you know, obviously for, for people over 65 and, you know, younger than that who are, who are uh, on disability, no longer pays for what they call preventable readmissions within 30 days of discharge uh, for an initial you – know, for certain conditions, including congestive heart failure, I believe pneumonia, heart attack, and there are about five or six others that, that have been added in the, in the last couple of years. But essentially it means if, if somebody comes into the hospital with one of those conditions, you can't just send them home and say good luck uh, Then because if they come back within 30 days – uh, Medicare will not pay the hospital again for the for the same treatment. So they now have a, a financial incentive to make sure that the patient gets uh, set up with the proper follow up care. For example, a um, you know an office visit with with their uh, primary care doctor. Uh-huh. Uh huh. But you know it's thousands of dollars each time, and you know can add up into the millions uh, in payments that are withheld. And this has forced hospitals to to rethink how they go through the discharge process they can't just you know dump people on the street or or send them home and say good luck and and so tell me i mean i i could see going that both ways i mean yeah. i mean is that just something that you think is um a positive thing or is it possible that both of these things are i mean that there's some positive and some negative about it i mean tell me what you think about that well, sure. I mean, uh, I've heard people say there hasn't been any data to support it yet, but I've heard people say, well, there's going to be a spike in readmissions on day 31. Well, sure, right. <laughs> uh, sure. There, there's always going to be someone trying to game the system, but sure. you know, the, if you can eliminate some of the waste, I think I think it's worth it. But more importantly, it's it's caused hospitals to rethink how they plan. The discharge process, how they, uh, you know, deal with cases, uh, you know, how they deal with complicated cases where you know, there has to be follow-up care, and this this goes to what's called continuity of care, uh, essentially improving communications between different providers. So the hospital admits a patient to home, but there there may be a you know, a nurse case manager who checks in on the or, – or a home health worker who goes and checks in on the person for the, the first 30 days after they've been discharged to make sure that they have, you know, filled their prescriptions, are taking their medications as prescribed, and have gotten to the doctor for their the follow-up visit to make sure that, uh, you know, that they're not going to have a relapse. What would be the – what would be the single most – impactful and yet easy to implement change to the system as it exists. Okay. I think something else that, that is already happening and it's called in various forms in various forms it's called bundling bundled payments or accountable care. Uh essentially it's uh, the the hospital or the health system is instead of being paid for each procedure or each test, is given one lump sum by the insurance company, whether it be Medicare or a private insurer, or to manage all aspects of the of that episode of care. And to okay. make sure that there is follow up care and that the patient is is uh taken care of at home. Okay. Now you were also um talking to me about uh, some of the the things involved in the um you know what's called HIPAA the health information right. uh, what is it portability health, and health care health insurance portability and accountability act okay and of course that's <laughs> actually that's actually from the Clinton um yes, Clinton era, it was, a lot of you may remember it back when it was still uh 
it's still going through Congress. It was the what was known as the Kennedy Kassebaum bill. <laughs> My dad always called it the Hiding Ill People's Papers Act. <laughs> uh, he he was certainly onto something there. <laughs> exactly. Um, and so, actually, one of the things that you talked about is the person's um, right to medical records. And, and yes. tell me about that. Sure. The HIPAA regulation, the HIPAA privacy rule, which has actually been in place since 2002, I think everybody's familiar with it at this point. But when you go to the doctor or you go to the hospital or you really, or you go anywhere, really, go to the pharmacy, you, you know, any kind of health or medical service at all, you're given a notice of privacy practices. That's the or or what they'll call the HIPAA notice, which says you you have certain rights, and then the health the facility has certain rights about what they can do with the data. They can share it for what they call treatment payment or, or health care operations. So so they're allowed to share to share your information so they can get paid or and so they can provide the treatment. But uh, many times more than more than a few times when when people go and ask for copies of their records the hospital says oh well, no we can't release that uh or the doctor's office says we can't release that because of HIPAA well HIPAA actually says the exact opposite okay it says that you have a right to uh, a copy of your records okay and it has to be delivered in a in a timely manner uh, at the lowest reasonable cost, uh, you know they're allowed to charge a, a with a reasonable um, duplication fee. Where if it's electronic, it should be practically nil the duplication fee. If it's on paper, yeah, there may be a cost for you know for photocopying and whatnot, you know, for the labor involved in that. But if it's if it's electronic, it should be next to nothing to produce well, it yet. And you do you think, think that people are taking advantage of that too? I mean, are they? Um, uh, absolutely, um, absolutely. Uh, well, and just last week, now, for, oh, 14 years after the rule went into effect, the uh, Department of Health and Human Services Office for Civil Rights, which is responsible for enforcing the privacy and security rules under HIPAA, issued a guidance on the right to access. To data, uh, it's really something that should have never been required. But they actually had to put out a guidance last week, an official guidance uh, from the federal government, that said um, individuals must be given access upon request. You know, when upon request, um, that health healthcare organizations must uh, provide this information uh, to the individual. Um, wow. So 15 know, years as, later, yeah. people are still trying to hide behind that. Yes. And it's been a barrier. And basically, it's just uh, – it's been an excuse for laziness or it's been an excuse for lack of transparency, like maybe they're trying to hide something. Uh, inter- there's this program actually that probably – that some people in some markets may have heard of uh, called Open Notes. That first was launched at, um, I believe, at uh, Massachusetts General Hospital, at Geisinger Health System in in Pennsylvania, and at Harborview Medical Center out in Seattle, uh, where they would, uh, with a a small group of about 100 doctors, said, we're going to open up all of our clinical notes and give patients full access to the unedited notes and see if number one, if it's useful to the patients, and number two, uh, if they can understand what's going on in there, you know, even with all the medical jargon, and uh-huh. uh, you know, a study that that was published in a peer-reviewed journal found, I think, greater than 95% uh, acceptance positivity, and I think all but one doctor uh, that participated in the original test continued with it. Now it's, uh, it's expanded to, uh, now something like 10 million patients have access through, through this. They, they don't even call it a program anymore. They call it a movement. Oh, so, um, uh, it, it probably has changed the way that doctors have, and nurses have 
documented the charts too a little bit. They have to be a little more a more a little more sensitive. I, I've seen studies that have shown well. You know, certain shorthand can be misinterpreted. You see the the letters S O B written in a medical record. It actually means shortness of breath. <laughs> well, but you can obviously see how it can be, you know, misinterpreted. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, but don't you think that that I mean that to me is maybe and one of the things that that I think people confront when they deal with the healthcare system is that. It is so impersonal and so sort of divorced from everyday life that that maybe you know kind of and, and intimidating too, right? And and maybe greater understanding that uh, this is exactly what's going to happen. That mm-hmm. people are going to be able to see these things, um, you know, that that might have some real positive effect. Uh, yeah, so far it has been. Uh, you know, they haven't really tried it in you know some of the more difficult specialties. Uh, again, it's 10 million people do do have access uh, th- through this program, but you know that leaves 300 million in this country who don't. Right, right. So, uh, I uh, my advice would be go to your doctor. You know, if you want to see a copy of your record, you have a right to see it. And uh, if they say, well, HIPAA d- d- prevents us from doing it, well, no, that's the exact opposite. HIPAA actually forces them to do it. Well, and and because so what, what should people they people do? Know, knowing their people knowing their rights. Okay. Well, so what should people do if they hear that? If they do that, well, you know, it's going to be hard, to, really, to say, well, go to the HHS website and look up the Office for Civil Rights. And, <laughs> Yeah, I, I I think the government needs to do a little bit better job uh, advertising this. I think health systems need to do a better job advertising this too. Uh, I, I think you know I shouldn't have to call in call in a lawyer. I don't want to you know demean your profession, but you know I don't <laughs> think you, your legal counsel should be needed every time somebody needs a copy of their own medical records. Right. Right, and and of course that's what we want to do is, uh, but I guess what you could say is they could maybe find some support for that if they went to the Health and Human Services website. Would that be a good yeah. place for them to go? Yeah, yeah, it would be the the uh, Office for Civil Rights at Department at HHS. Uh, you might just you know look up HIP, HIPAA rights, that sort of thing. Okay. There, there are uh, there, there is a, a small movement out there called Get My Health Data that launched last summer, uh, you know, trying to get people by by the millions to to request their records, and I don't think they've gotten that kind of critical mass just yet. Because you know, I'm, I'm t- mentioning it to you, and you've probably never heard of it. No, no, I've never heard of that. But just to just a sense to just take some of that power. Um, right. You know, back in consumers' hands. Yeah. Well, that that's great info, um, Neil. Because I, I, yeah, so it comes down to you know, knowledge is power. Oh yeah, definitely. Well, and and certainly with such a you know powerful story, you know, such a story that you have of mm-hmm. um, seeing just how personally it can affect someone. Um, tell me what you've done to raise awareness for uh, for MSA. Well, sure. I've uh, taken it to the extreme a little bit. <laughs> I, uh, my uncle and I uh, did a uh, an eight, a 700 plus mile bike tour from Chicago to Washington D.C. Uh, the summer before last. Okay. Uh, and... That was, yeah. No good. Uh, stopping along the way, um, meeting up with support groups in some of the cities along the way there's you know some real good uh support groups in uh in Ohio in particular a uh, big group in Columbus not quite as big of a group but a pretty active group in in the Dayton area uh you know finally finishing up at uh my my mom's house outside of Washington DC and then the next day uh going down to to uh the US Capitol where we met another group uh that with a similar disease, for a similar disease that was just happened to have their meeting and their lobby day uh, that that very day. 
So uh, we raised about nine thousand dollars. Hopefully, touched a lot of people. Well, well and and you actually um, uh, sorry, part of that involved Capitol Hill, right? I mean, was it yeah. there? Well, okay. I wasn't. I I didn't do any lobbying myself. I don't think they'd let me into a congressional office, uh, you know, <laughs> in, in in bike shorts. <laughs> Maybe they would. I don't know. I didn't try. Well, there you go. Maybe you need to try. But I, we did finish up uh, at the Capitol. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, that's uh, and and so um, tell me a little bit about where people want to go if they want to learn more about your stuff. Tell me, tell me where they should. Sure. Work. Okay. Yeah. Um, no, I would start with Med City News, where I write every day. MedCityNews dot com, all, all uh-huh. one word. Uh huh. Um, you can also just. Uh, want to find out a little bit more about the, the bike tour that I did. I have a website, uh, msatour.net, msatour.net. Uh, it's a little bit out of date, but I am planning on updating it soon because I do want to uh, put together another – I'm going to be putting together another event uh, this okay. coming summer. We didn't do anything okay. last year, but I will be doing something this year. And, uh, you know, a lot of my old work, just Google my name. Neil Vercel, and uh, okay. the spelling will be on the yeah. I'll uh, put it on the, I'll on put the it file. Yep, side. on your web on on your site. That's great. Well, thank you, Neil. I appreciate it. This is good stuff and and very helpful stuff for understanding. You know what these large pieces of legislation that nobody bothers to read how they actually yeah. really do impact and the rights they give you. So that's great to know. Yeah, once upon a time, I actually read the entire HIPAA privacy rule. <laughs> well, that was a fun month, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> so, all right, Neil, thank you very much, and we'll talk to you later. All right, thanks for having me, Dale. Okay. All right, thanks. I'll get that put together and put up and you know, tell Med City News that we're doing this. All right, I will. I already told my boss just you know so so he gets ahead of, so he's not surprised. Uh, oh, he's uh, really cool. So he said, really "Cool, okay. you know, as long as I'm doing it after hours." Uh, oh yeah. And I'm not, and I'm not, uh, you know, competing against myself, which I'm not. Uh huh. Absolutely. So, well, yeah. Tell him to post some links, and we'll get some traffic. So. Yeah, I will. I'll certainly tweet it out. Uh, Med City will probably retweet it. Uh, the Med City account has something like 25,000 followers. Oh, cool. Very cool. So, All right, man. Well, I'll get it up, and I'll talk to you soon. Yeah, thanks. All right, thanks. Thanks, Bye. Okay. Bye.